9. Belly of the Beast. The remnants of the haggard expedition navigated what had to be an esophagus with ice picks and knives. So slick and steep was the flesh of the angled tunnel that walking down it upright was impossible. Hence, hugging the sides, they would hook the wall with their small, sharp picks, then hang their weight from the handle as they leaned forward and planted a knife further down. The pick would then be slid free, and the process would begin again with the weight being bolstered by the knife as they swung. These tears in the soft tissue bled black when the blades left them, and sealed themselves shut like folding flower petals as the god hunters progressed ever downward. When the tunnel itself buckled and contracted as the tissue drove great streams of half-liquefied runoff from the mouth down the furrows on the floor, they halted only progressing when the tremors ceased and their already shaky footing was more certain in the gloom. This made for slow going, but there was no telling what waited at the bottom of the sloped tunnel, and descending it like children on a grotesque slide seemed suicidal. Stan had a headlight to use, as did Soraya, but there was no spare for Luther, leaving him to grip a flashlight in his mouth as he went. All the while, he kept keen for the ring of gunfire down the passage after them, but it never came. Agonizing as the pace was, ragged as his upper body felt after the descent through the mouth, he forced himself to keep going, reminding himself that there were pursuers at their backs, even if they couldn't see or hear them. The whispers inched back into the corners of his consciousness now and then, biting deep when they chose to make themselves known. They told him he was in danger, that he wasn't cut out for the journey he'd undertaken. They told Luther he'd already transgressed too heavily to be let go for free. There had to be a price, and that price was his two remaining companions. If he could kill them, then perhaps the dreamer would tell its children to stand down. Perhaps it would allow him to clamber back up out of its maw unopposed. Luther buried these poisoned notions beneath his material concerns, about the stinging air and the burning sensation which teased his weary eyes. The stench which had filled the mouth waxed and waned here, occasionally being overridden by a paint-thinner reek which seemed to make his nostrils itch. He heard Stan speculate they were poisoning themselves by so totally drinking in the toxic air that a return journey would be impossible and heard Soraya tell him there would be no return journey, something they all knew on some level. Luther squinted against the faint fumes, grit his teeth against the whispers, and followed as closely as he could. The esophagus, or throat, or whatever it was, was strange in that it often curved and banked off to one side or the other, making the declining floor even more difficult to predict since one could only see so far along the route before a great misshapen wall of soft, jiggling meat cut off one's vision. In time, the tunnel began to widen, and the slope became much more pronounced. They were beginning to emerge into a dark, vast chamber, and though it took a moment for their eyes to adjust to the clouds of burning gas and the dim openness of the space after the confines of the throat, they soon noticed distant lights bobbing in the toxic mist. Luther could only guess that what he was seeing was a stomach. They stood upon the treacherous shore of a venomous lake of gurgling, yellow-brown liquid, which steamed in the meager beams of their flashlights. Organic shoots or chimneys of a cartilaginous sort of flesh belched clouds of acrid smoke and spouted geysers of sizzling liquid, the air was hot and heavy, and the place vibrated every few seconds with rippling tremors that rattled the waxy tissue that made up the walls. The dim, flickering light seemed to be floating like buoys in the acid lake, though Luther internally revised the word floating to swimming after witnessing one flit across his field of view using a thick tail like a tadpole's. Vast mounds of slop, likely once the remains of creatures from the surface, 
had formed gelatinous islands which jutted like towers from the mist. Amidst it all buzzed airborne hordes of what sounded like gnats, tiny and near invisible, which had a habit of diving into the eyes of the struggling observers. How are we going to get across that? It took Luther a moment to realize it was Stan who spoke. His lightheadedness, both from lack of sleep and the assault of the fumes upon his hazy mind, left him slow to register what was happening around him. The dreamer's hushed speech competing with the question made it difficult to assign the words to a single person, especially when his watering eyes made it difficult to see Stan speak. Stan seemed to be feeling much the same, his words coming slow and sluggish through the murky air. Only Soraya seemed to be forcing himself by some uncanny will to keep himself keen. We won't, Soraya answered. We go around. Follow me. Soraya, taking Aram's accustomed place at the front, tread on cautious feet over the damp and fluid ground to the edge of the flesh island upon which they stood. The walls of the cavernous digestive organ banked up out of view above them in the fumes, but at the lake's edge, the arc of those walls left a small lip of space between the shoreline and the upward slope of the stomach lining. It was a thin, three-foot-wide, treacherously steep beach of sorts. One wrong move, and they would slide into the slurry with the rest of the dreamer's fodder. Again they took to using their knives and picks to bolster themselves as they slipped and slid along the rim of the pool. The blinking lights of the things which swam the acid and the buzzing drone of the parasitic insects which taunted their ears melded with the grumbling bass of the organ's slow contractions to lull each of them into a stupor. They moved ever forward around the lake, but they did not register the passage of time or the danger which lay so close to them. This was, perhaps, a blessing, for in the confusion of the stomach the group had no presence of mind to dwell upon the horrible nature of the environment, or the acrid burn in their lungs. They had no conscious care for the tumbles that brought their feet so close to that slow-burning fluid in the seemingly endless pool. They focused only on the way forward. Luther could only imagine the others were hearing the dreamer's voice as steadily as he was but none among their number risked showing it. The searing eyes, the rasping breaths, the pounding heart, it could all end right there. If only he listened to the whispers. If only he did as he was asked. I think it's afraid. Soraya spoke the words from up front loud enough for the others to hear, though again it took both Stan and Luther a few seconds to even register them. Neither asked Soraya to elaborate, to delineate what he meant. They all knew, and the words rang true. The whispers had become pleading. Though Luther had not heard them until reaching the mouth, the others had seemed to believe the whispers were things of barbarous rapture, promises of strength and power and bloodshed. Until that moment, Luther had merely thought the enemy was taking a different tact with him, that he was, as Aram had hinted, not vulnerable to the dreamer's crimson promises. As Soraya spoke that speculation aloud, he realized that he wasn't alone. Luther wasn't the only one being bargained with, rather than proselytized to. The whispers died out soon after that. It made Luther uneasy, for he couldn't help but assume the dreamer had taken notice of their newfound resolve. The nervous anticipation of that silence forced his mind to clear a little in the haze, to shove aside the pain and the weariness and the demoniac vileness which engulfed him, and wait for whatever came next. The others shared the cautious vigilance, scanning the disgusting expanse about them. Surely it was plotting something. Whether it was or not, there was something in the pool which had plans for them and their vigilance was rewarded. Soraya, the furthest forward in line, was the first to see and alert the others, dark masses of half-digested flotsam shifting like waste in a drain. Great gobs of the liquefying flesh and refuse were slithering like living things from the banks of the nearest islands in the lake, navigating the bile towards the shore. They would submerge soon before the shallows, 
depriving the three survivors on the banks of the comfort of knowing where they were. The three picked up their pace, but it was not enough to deter the stalkers in the pool. When next the things emerged from the steaming liquid, they had amassed themselves into the rough outlines of misshapen, featureless, swollen human beings. The snot consistency of them meant they held no permanent form, that they shifted and jiggled and shuddered as they moved. Extra appendages would burst from their shiny mass only to be sucked back in like withdrawn tongues. Chunks of bone or sinew not fully rendered down into the acid studded their half-solid bodies like armored exoskeletons and shot forth in barbs from their limbs as retractable claws. All this movement and metamorphosis was conducted in dead silence as the things rose from the shallows of the acid lake and stumbled on shaky legs towards them. There were no cries of alert or roars of savage hunger. There was only the drip of acid from the damp and half-formed flesh of the things as they closed in with the survivors against the wall. No one thought to shoot the things. They were so liquescent and formless that it seemed mad to believe physical force could hurt them. All the three could do was scramble and hope they could find an exit before the things reached them. For all their horrible, silent menace, the stalkers in the pool were wading through the shadows towards them from about twenty yards off, and they were moving slow. Luther clumsily sheathed his knife and continued on with only his pick to bolster him, meaning he moved in unsteady lunges which were ended with a swing into the fleshy stomach wall, and a breathless moment of balancing on the edge of a stumble before the next lunge could be undertaken. The others fled in much the same way, panting and coughing as their lungs struggled to power their more rapid motion in the miasma of chemical rot which surrounded them. Every leap was a gamble that they'd catch themselves before sliding down the slope into the shallows just a few feet to the side, a gamble made all the more tense by the fact that their pursuers didn't ever seem thrilled or ravenous at the sight of struggling prey. They merely shambled on in silent, steady, unrelenting pursuit. As they rounded a small inlet in the organic shoreline, Luther traced the outline of a large outcrop of swollen tissue ahead. It bordered a dark opening in the stomach wall, an inlet just like the one through which they'd entered. A similar shallow creek of fetid runoff slid down into the lake from its mouth. This one was much smaller and wove off from the digestive organ at a level with the ground there. As they drew nearer, Luther began to allow himself to believe that they were about to escape, that they could slip from the stomach unscathed and try to plot another route of attack. He was mistaken. Just a few scant yards from the edge of the bank upon which the tunnel opened, Stan overshot his mark in the jump. His lurch saved his footing, but he bumped Soraya from behind in the process. Only the towering man's weight saved him from being knocked fully from his feet. Still, he slid on the slickened bank and splayed towards the lake. Though he scrambled free of the hissing liquid in a matter of seconds, his left boot was soaked, and as the three of them stumbled up onto the wider bank before the tunnel mouth, Soraya writhed to slip his steaming shoe free from his foot. With Stan's frenzied aid, they managed to get the thing off in a matter of moments but the skin beneath was already swollen and red with the onset of a bad burn, and the lurkers behind them were beginning to heave themselves up from the lake onto the fleshy, not-so-dry ground. They had to run, no time to gather their wits. They barreled into the tighter mirror of the throat they'd traversed before, momentarily relieved the slope was almost non-existent, and their flight wasn't a thing of half-stumbles and tottering balance. Their pursuers were apparently slower upon the meaty land than in the searing sea of acid, for after several frenzied minutes of running up the passage, they could no longer see their shadows in the awful yellow light of the gleaming stomach chamber they'd abandoned. The haze of the burning mists lifted, and though the stench remained, clarity crept back into the edges of Luther's vision, and he found he could breathe without pain once more. It was only as they drew the lights again and went about orientating themselves 
that Luther realized Soraya had made the whole of the blasted escape on one bare foot. The sole of the big man's left foot was blistered and peeling beneath the stark light of the electric beams. Worse still, it was streaked with a black, dusty grime, a sort of mold or fungus which took root in the textured flesh of the slumbering god's many throats. He shook off Stan and Luther's concern, said he couldn't really feel his foot anyhow, so it wasn't important, but they all sensed it was anything but fine. There's no use worrying about it now, he said. We have one goal, anything else is a distraction. Can you walk on that? Soraya shook off Stan's question. Like I said, I can't feel it. So long as that lasts and the leg is intact, I can keep going. Luther and Stan let it rest at that. Soraya had been galvanized by arm's loss in the mouth, and some small measure of the other man's fire had been breathed into the younger initiate. It was easy to see as much as he took the lead once more, and led them on long, confident strides up the path and away from the lake. Though Stan insisted he'd take the load of the heavy, condensed pack Soraya had carried thus far, Soraya asked for no more favors, and seemingly needed none. They spoke among themselves, all seeming to agree another passage through the stomach might mean death, but all equally convinced the throat along which they walked might well lead them right back to the mouth, even if it took them to a different maw somewhere else in the warped mountains that was only going to shift them further from the heart. Though they looked for openings or breaks in the alien esophagus they traveled, there were no obvious gaps. It was during a surreal rest to eat a small measure of their light rations and catch their ragged breath that Luther began to notice that the two black streaks along either side of the fleshy walls bulged almost imperceptibly every few seconds. This motion was independent of the lazy rippling of the rest of the tissue, and the color in the dark line seemed to deepen with each hint of movement. They were large, about five feet in width, but their hue was tinted by the meat which enclosed them, making them seem far smaller than they were at a glance. The now familiar tone of the murmuring dreamer brushed against his skull the moment he laid eyes upon those streaks. Something about riches and position in the new order which was being built above. Luther didn't listen. That intrusion was all he needed to hear to believe he might be on to something. Luther walked to the wall and put the knife he'd been using to navigate the flesh passages to the soft, pulsing skin along the dark streak. With some effort, he plunged the tip in, slow and cautious, stepping aside as he made the motions. Black blood spouted from the raw gap as he slid free the blade. Stan reeled, stumbling back and away from the tunnel wall, asking, What is that? A map to the heart, maybe, Soraya said, understanding immediately and drawing up next to Luther to better inspect the steady stream of the dreamer's blood now draining down the esophagus channel behind them. It's a vein. I've been too focused on moving to pay attention to whether we were moving the right way. It might be better than a map, Luther said. It might be a road. He turned out to be right. After fifteen or twenty minutes spent monitoring the flow of blood, the stream seemed to die down. Though it never truly abated, the black dyed vein into which Luther had sliced seemed to have lost a great deal of the lifeblood it transported. What was left was a claustrophobic, winding tunnel adjacent to the esophagus, low-ceilinged, and filled with a slow-moving tide of ebon blood which would reach roughly to a man's knee. The strange walls seemed almost hard, not bone, but perhaps a sort of sturdy cartilage. Luther was the first to climb up into the newly opened tunnel, finding his boots and pants soaked with the viscous, lukewarm liquid as he sloshed up the way to ensure the thing was traversable. Only when he'd given the all-clear did he help Soraya up into the vein, both of them grimacing to think the peeling skin of his acid-eaten foot would be immersed in the stuff. Stan brought up the rear, gun in hand, still having caught no sight of the things from the stomach in pursuit. 
with a little jostling to get the big pack stand and taken up, situated low enough on his back that it didn't graze the low ceiling as he moved along in a slouch. They began to discuss which direction they should move. The safest bet seemed to be downward, against the lazy current of the distant pulses stirring the fluid at their feet. For Luther reasoned the vein in which they stood must be one taking blood up to the mouth, or some other appendage of the wakening god. Soraya pointed out, rightly enough, that they had no way of knowing how close the dreamer's biology mirrored that of life with which they were familiar, but in the end it was decided that they'd move down toward the depths against the flow. Luther, being judged most nimble, would lead through the confined darkness. The others would follow. "'Your brother was right about you,' Soraya half-joked as they got moving, his tired voice echoing down the path before them. "'The same spark of cunning is in you, even if it took a long time to dig it up.' Luther realized as he forged on in silence beneath the assault of the dreamer's constant hissing promises that Soraya was right and that revelation surprised him far more than it could ever have surprised the big initiate trotting along unsteadily in his wake.